It's great to be back. Welcome back. Thank you for joining. I'm super happy to introduce a special session today, a little bit of a different format. Um, we're going to be having um, four speakers and then uh, a fifth uh, team member of theirs will be joining for uh, a moderated discussion following the talk. Um, and uh, the, the subject is going to be um, multimodal single cell data, open benchmarks and a NeurIPS 2021 competition. Um, so we have John Bloom from Celerity. Um, so for those of you who joined more recently, um, John and I founded MIA, I guess, five or six years ago at this point. Um, uh, and it's, it's really, really great to have you back, John. Um, John is at Celerity now. Uh, we also have Alexandra Chloe Villani from the Center for Immunology and Inflammatory Disease uh, at MGH and HMS and Broad. Um, we have Angela Pisco from the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub uh, and Daniel Burkhart from uh, Celerity. Um, and we will also have Malta Lucan uh, joining for the discussion. Anyway, thank you all so much for being here today, uh, speakers and guests and, and audience and everybody. I'm looking forward to a great session. Um, after the talk, we'll transition into a moderated discussion and I'll explain how that will work then. John, why don't you take it away? Great. So we're really excited to be here. Um, it's, it's a bit of a homecoming. Uh, and uh, what we're going to talk about today as uh, Alex said, uh, is multimodal single cell data, open benchmarks, and uh, related to this, a NeurIPS competition. Uh, so uh, in 2020, I actually moved uh, a couple of buildings down uh, to Celerity, where I, where I now think a lot about machine learning and experimental design as it relates to uh, drug discovery. And of course, part of how we can understand disease these days is through uh, single cell technologies. And all of us here are part of a larger consortium effort that has come together. Uh, and so you're seeing representatives of that effort. Uh, but basically in outline, what we're gonna talk about is how uh, is multimodal single cell technologies, which measure the high dimensional molecular state of cells across layers of cellular identity and dynamics. And we're gonna explain how we're putting together components to create an extensible sandbox for open benchmarking of computational methods that, that leverage these really exciting new data types. So I'll talk about uh, adapting the common task framework for machine learning to single cell analysis uh, at a high level. Then Angela is gonna dig into how these multimodal technologies came around and work. Uh, Chloe is gonna talk about uh, looking specifically at, at human bone marrow from a multimodal view and, and the data set that we've created uh, to support uh, computational method uh, development in human bone marrow. And then Daniel is gonna bring things together with the different components of uh, the sandbox and the tasks in the competition. So the common task framework, um, it's a term that I heard first in, in David Domino's uh, paper, 50 Years of Data Science. And uh, I'm wondering where it came from. Uh, here's a paper actually from 1985, and it's about automatic speech recognition. So audio to text, and if you read here, it says definitive tests to fully characterize automatic speech recognition or system performance cannot be specified at present. However, it is possible to design and conduct performance assessments tests that make use of widely available speech databases, use test procedures similar to those used by others and are well-documented. And these provide valuable benchmark data. By contrast, Tests that make use of speech databases that are not made available to others and for which the test procedures and results are poorly documented provide little objective information on system performance. Such tests might be termed incomparable in that the data obtained cannot be meaningfully compared with other data for other tests or for other systems. So actually this, this is, it seems, uh, the root of a framework that is probably very familiar to many of us today, and we see it in formal machine learning competitions all the time, uh, including at NeurIPS. And there are three components that uh, are identified here. The public and private training data sets with ground truth, a common task that competitors can train on, and a scoring referee that objectively and automatically reports accuracy. I, I, I don't need to say this in detail because you know many of you will be very familiar with famous examples. Uh, for example, protein structure prediction this year, uh, AlphaFold goes back to CASP in 1984. There's MNIST for handwriting, Netflix for movie recommendations, ImageNet, uh, and so on. And 
in Donahoe's paper, he, he remarks that those fields where machine learning has scored successes are essentially those fields where this framework has been applied systematically. And I, I think we all recognize there's a tension. On the one hand, we know that these kinds of setups are have been enormously constructive for uh, improving the performance of models on predictive tasks. Uh, we also know that uh, prediction, at least on its face, while much of science is, is about prediction, um, that's not all of science. And in this case here, uh, you know, understanding how these models predict how they do is often really about it, in the service of prediction by asking, for example, if we remove parts of the model, um, you know, what does that leave us? On the other hand, I think there are a number of examples we have seen where high performance on prediction is made possible either because of encoding inductive biases that are based on scientific knowledge or knowledge of the domain uh, into the model framework, uh, or where features themselves are learned, abstract features such as in convolutional nets that speak to uh, underlying rules and structure, including, for example, in discovering, say, motifs of DNA that, that matter for regulation. I'm going to skip this, but it's in the slides. Uh, so. Speech is, is essentially just a signal in time. It's pretty perfectly measured, whereas single cell data we know is very challenging to model. The cells are themselves are, are among the most complex dynamical systems we know. When we use these technologies, you know, they're trying to get information out of a very small quantity of, well, physical space. And where there are hundreds of thousands of RNAs, hundreds of millions of proteins, measurement noise, these data sets are high dimensional and observations and features. The biological signal is often entangled in a nested way with donor specific and technical and bats effects. And if we think about ground truth, it's often uh, harder to come by in biology than in other fields where ML has shined. And I think that has made it often challenging to turn interesting uh, questions from the scientific point of view into you know, these kinds of challenges. Now, we do still have method development happening all over single cell biology, thousands of methods, and, and they all do measure performance and attempt to get better in certain ways, um, either through using fully simulated data, uh, synthetically modified sort of real data where you might introduce a perturbation uh, that is synthetic, but on top of real data. You might have real data with low dimensional ground truth because you designed an experiment that used additional barcodes to get at lineage, or you mix together species, or you have batches in time that you can then try to predict uh, you know, time points. There are ways to do that. Sometimes the features themselves are deleted and used as ground truth for imputation or for autoencoding. The truth is just recovering the data itself. The one I want to focus on here is manually annotated real data, where you know, this is probably the most biologically useful, uh, as far as biologists are concerned, um, for understanding and defining uh, say, tissues and cell types and states and dynamics, but it's quite challenging to scale because you need experts. Uh, it's difficult to integrate. And even the experts tell us that the evolving consensus is changing. So if you're trying to discover new cell types, uh, you can't do it by annotating just based on what you know. And this is in contrast to much of where ML and machine learning has uh, shined, where you have a pretty reliable ground truth. You don't need an expert to say, you know, this is a, there's a fox here and another one here, or this is a five, a zero, and a four. Um, but again, this is quite hard to scale in, 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 in single cell, and it's hard to do when the truth is what we're trying to discover. Dynamics, where you can just measure video or EMRs through time or weather, very popular in ML, quite hard when all of our sort of high throughput, comprehensive measurements of cells destroy the cells, so we can only measure them once. Now there's a third kind that, this isn't comprehensive, but I think it's interesting, multimodal measurement, right? Where, for example, in machine translation, you take a bunch of documents and you have them in one language and another language, and you try to create models that can predict one from the other, or going all the way back to speech recognition, predicting the text from the audio. It's a form of multimodal, you have multimodal measurement of both audio and the corresponding text, that's your truth, and you're trying to frame a prediction task where everyone can try to get better. And so the reason we came together around forming a, a common task framework in single cell biology 
actually relates to this last one, multimodal measurement, because only recently has it become possible to measure multiple modes of molecular state in single cells at high throughput. And so one way we can do it is by measuring the DNA accessibility in the nucleus together with the nuclear RNA. And Angela is going to tell us more about this and how it's done. And another way is by measuring the RNA together with uh, surface proteins and quantifying those. And so with this kind of multimodal ground truth, we get set up for certain tasks, such as predicting one modality from the other, similar to language translation, except here, it's not that you know, two documents contain exactly the same sentiment, and it's that these are two layers or views of the central dogma. They're actually mechanistically related, but it's incredibly complicated how, and the underlying sort of semantics or meaning is really the cell as a whole. So Daniel is gonna go into more details of these tasks, but at a high level, predicting one modality from another to enhance single cell modality data sets where only one is measured, to validate or infer underlying cellular processes, or perhaps even inform the effects of perturbations, like we see, say, with alpha fold, where you substitute an amino acid, you ask, how does that change the structure? Well, similar ideas here could be perhaps be applied. Uh, aligning cells across modalities and uh, jointly learning representations where you have both sets of information available, uh, where that information here is, again, it's complementary, it's not fully redundant, and it's mechanistically related at some level. So there already have been a few methods that have come out to take advantage of this kind of data. Um, Babel uh, in April, multi-VI two weeks ago, uh, some citations on the bottom. But if, and these are you know, already using deep learning, encoders, decoders, variational inference, and so on. Uh, but if single cell history is a guide, there soon be dozens to hundreds of published methods trying to leverage this data in ways like these and others. And we're gonna have a hard time understanding how their utility and performance will vary on compared to each other. Are we really making progress? How will these generalize in the real world where we have all these different tissues and uh, batches and donors and so on? And at the same time, creating this kind of data is going to be expensive and only some places will be able to do it, at all, if at all, uh, more so than measuring one modality. And so it's probably quite critical that we understand the advantages and limitations uh, of this data type so we can use it optimally. And so my last slide uh, is just to say, look, so to address these things, uh, what we're, we're really excited about helping do is build a community extensible sandbox for multimodal single cell analysis. There are three components you're gonna hear about. One is a, a pretty big effort to make a data set that is sort of fit for purpose for benchmarking in the open these kinds of methods. So it's, it's using two different tech, multimodal technologies. Um, across four sites, a bunch of donors, and it's human bone marrow that has been expertly annotated by the team. And, and you'll hear more from uh, Chloe about why we chose bone marrow. There's infrastructure that's been built on top of the open problems and single cell analysis framework for hosting the competition and in general for allowing people to bring together task metrics, methods, and data sets and, and do open benchmarking. Daniel will tell you more about it. This sandbox is the basis for our NURPS competition, uh, and uh, which is meant to engage a broad community in these uh, ideas, advocate for the problems, and foster collaboration. And uh, finally, are these tasks and metrics and data sets you know, comprehensive of what we need to, to fully leverage and develop all methods in a, a related to multimodal? Of course not. Um, but what we're most excited about is the idea that if the community can adopt such frameworks to benchmark uh, in the open, uh, then this could accelerate the impact of method development in single cell biology, especially in, in multimodal single cell biology as we, as we try to come to grips with a very complex, new and exciting uh, frontier of data. So I'm gonna stop my share and hand it over to Angela. Thank you. So um, I, it's a real pleasure to, to be here today. Um, I'm at the Chen Zuckerberg Biohub. I have been focusing on building whole organisms, uh, cell atlas to understand health and disease. And today my goal is to walk you through the value of creating um, a multimodal data set. So um, one of the the thing that as the, the Biohub has really been focusing on 
over the past um, couple of years is to generate large single cell atlas that describe a large number of cell types. And this is really close to the scale of the whole organism. But while generating the single cell atlas is very exciting, it reveals deep heterogeneity about the cell states, the transcription isn't everything. And the, the reason why we have focused on using the RNA as the readout is because until now, this is really the technology that we have been able to scale. But when we are interested in cell phase transitions, for example, during the differentiation of cell types like the, the dermal fibroblasts, which remain transcriptionally similar during, the, um, during their occupancy of the functional compartment, when we want to understand the process and shed some light about what's happening to the cells, we really need to think about how we can get information that's capable of really um, inform us about what's happening at the cellular level. Uh, and so uh, we, if we kind of like look at the, the timeline here, we can see that the first single cell transcriptome was published just a bit um, over 10 years ago. Uh, but since then, the technologies um, for making cheaper um, to have single cell transcriptomes, to make it more comprehensive, to make it faster, have really been popping up. And the time is now ripe to start exploring complementary technologies that will shed light on the missing um, pieces of the puzzle. Um, and so I'm going to be focusing on the I hope you can see my mouse. I'm going to, for this um, project, we have focused on generating simultaneous RNA and protein uh, measurements from the same cell and simultaneous RNA and attack from the same cells. And I will go into detail about what these acronyms mean. First, um, I want to just kind of like recap a bit of why we focus on single cell measures. So while every cell in the body has the same genome, their function is remarkably different. And um, the goal, especially in the context of large scale projects such as the human cell atlas, is to eventually have a map of the whole organism atlas, but it has to be navigable and it has to be interpretable. And, until now, we've really been focusing on using the transcriptome information to um, inform on like, what is the position of these cells? What do they look like? But we need to start considering the epigenetic layer that informs us about the regulatory networks that are triggering the decisions of the cells and also combined with protein information. Can I slide that? Okay. It's advancing now. And all together, this will allow us to, to bring this picture to life. One thing that I really want to call here is I, that I don't think that the goal should really be to measure all of these modalities in all the cells. The key is to understand the value that each modality brings and then combine them in a way that it really boosts our understanding. Because just adding a modality for the sake of adding a modality is not really going to enhance the comprehensibility of the atlas. So um, as I mentioned before, one of the techniques that we are using is the simultaneous profiling of the transcriptome and the epigenome from the same cell. For that, we rely on the 10x genomics multiome kit. So in, in brief, what happens here is that in the, um, in the kit, we have gel beads that have two barcodes. So one of them is a poly DT sequence, which recognizes the poly A of the RNA. And this is what allows us to do gene expression libraries. But in these uh, beads, there is a second sequence. So the first sequence, the poly DT, is the typical 10x reaction. The second one is a spacer sequence. And with this spacer sequence, it attaches to the transpose DNA fragments for the attack library. So attack is, um, it just stands for assay for transposase accessible chromatin. And I have a, like a schematic here. I don't wanna spend too much time, but just to, to make sure that we are all on the same page. What happens is there is um, the transposome, which uh, 
can bind to a fragment of the DNA if that fragment is open. So a region about 300 base pairs. And on each side of the, of the, 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 the fragment, there will be a cut. And this is a double strand cut. And these fragments then get tagged because you have the insertion, the, the insertion of these regions here colored in blue and green. And we make use of these um, transposed DNA fragments to then, um, that, to then just get that pieces of the DNA. And that's how we can measure which regions um, were available to being transcribed. And um, if there are like more questions, I'm happy to go over this in the, in the discussion. But so just to bring us back, we have these um, full of the gel beads, we have transposed nuclei, um, and then this is combined. Uh, so there's an emulsion of these transposed nuclei in the gel beads. And then it's very much like a typical um, Tanek library, but that we have the two types of barcoded fragments that then allow us to generate the single cell library and the single cell, the, the tech library and the gene expression library. One thing that I want to call the attention here, uh, and this is going to be important for, for people analyzing the data, is that when we're looking at gene expression, we have a fixed feature space, certainly for the, for the species uh, for which we have a genome. So we know which genes we expect, we can count. The, uh, the presence of those genes and how many times we see um, certain copies. But when we're thinking about the ataxic, the, the feature space is variable because what we're really measuring is which features are now accessible given a certain state of the cell. And for us to be able to bring together data, and this is not just true for data that is being generated here, but even when um, we are combining published data with, um, with new data that we're generating. We need to run everything together so that we can have the ataxic data on the same feature space. And this is how we are able to then quantify if there are features, meaning regions of the DNA that were accessible and are no longer are, or that now we are able to measure. And so the analysis has to be all together for, the, for these libraries. So if we bring in new data, we have to kind of like go back into the, into the fast Q step and run cell ranger for, for all of them. The other modality that we have is the CiteSeq. So here we are looking at the same cell transcriptome and immunophenotyping. So CiteSeq stands for cellular indexing of transcriptomes and epitopes by sequencing. And this technology relies on engineering antibodies with a barcode. So now the readout becomes sequenceable because we have a sequencing barcode that we can uh, detect on the libraries. And the key aspect here, so this is a complicated figure and I'm gonna try to walk you quickly. We, the antibodies have this barcode and cells will be expressing certain antigens. So these are antibodies that recognize naturally um, expressing antigens by the cells. Not all the cells express all the antibodies. So the first step is to um, bind the antibodies to the cells. And then only the ones that are covalently bound will be the ones that remain and can get um, encapsulated on the droplets. And then later during the process of the library prep, the cells are lysed and then two libraries again are made. One that is the standard uh, cDNA library and the other one that we can use to then get the matching protein information. So for both the multi ohm kit and the CiteSeq, the key is that we have the same cell barcode so we can say which reads for the antibody and the RNA or which reads for the ataxic fragments and the RNA are coming from the same cell. And now I'm gonna open this up to Chloe, who is gonna tell us about how far we have gone on building this multimodal data set. Thank you, Angela. So um, I'm here representing the biologist community. So I've been part 
of the broad community since 2010, uh, part of the Sasuke's program and the immunology program and at MDJ.org, the single cell genomics research program. And I currently active bridge, I'm actively bridging with the broad for the Human Cell Atlas Initiative. I'm one of the three uh, coordinators of the Immune Cell Atlas worldwide for this effort. So Angela already uh, explained or described the Human Cell Atlas effort, right? Or, our mission is to create a comprehensive reference map of all immune cells. And before I jump into talking about bone marrow cells, I want to try to you know, make a point that this competition may generate new frameworks that would be widely applicable to a larger community. Um, and so, you know, these single cell technologies are now poised to empower us and analyze a wide range of tissue. I'm most interested by immune cells. My world is immune cell centric, and I want to build the case of why is it so important that this competition is leveraging immune cell data sets and then I'll justify bone marrow. So I strongly believe that in the cell atlas effort, the immune, the immune system is one of the most challenging one to work with. And, and this, is, this is why first, it's made up of a network of specialized organs. It's not a single organ that we're trying to analyze like just a lung, for example. And, and, and there are several cells across organs that are working together to protect us from a range of invaders. Um, every single human tissue needs to be analyzed because they're both resident and circulating immune cells, which means we'll need to be able to do some data transfer between different tissues and studies. There's a large number of immune cell states to map across individuals and across organ system. And the immune cells, they can change their cellular composition, their expression profile across age, gender, tissue localization, geographical regions, ancestry, health, and disease status. So it becomes really important to be able to distinguish between biological heterogeneity and technical noise, which we will be addressing to this uh, challenge. And the immune cell identities are really complex. We call these cells very plastic because they can change their identities depending on their environment, external and internal cues, which we'll also talk about in the context of bone marrow. And one of our tasks through the immune cell atlas is to map the full spectrum of immune cell identities, which will ultimately require integration of multimodal data types for every tissue. And that requires different sampling strategies, cutting edge technologies that Angela just described, and actually new scalable computational integrative frameworks, which are currently lacking in our field. Um, and so with that, some of the key questions when someone like myself, experts, or other end data user are asking when they're getting their single cell data back is how, how do you define what's a stable cell type or subtypes based on the clustering of data uh, defined by shared features, which could be RNA, open chromatin, protein, or a combination of all of the above. I mentioned to you that these cells are not black and white in their clusterings. Their, ident their identity can shift a plastic, which means they're part of a cell spectrum. And that becomes really hard to figure out what are the boundaries of the different stage of the cell spectrum. It's also really at this stage unclear how we can systematically and accurately leverage both unbiased approach as well as legacy knowledge from, for example, the immunology community to properly annotate our cell type identities. And that's really key so we can compare across study and data type. And it's becoming clear that we actually need this type of multimodal data type to empower more precise cell type definition. So why bone marrow, right? Bone marrow 101, I promise I won't bore you with the details of um, hematopoiesis, but bone marrow is this, the main site of hematopoiesis, you know, producing blood and all immune cells that are in circulation in your body. And through the years, the field of uh, bone marrow biology has been driven by technological advances. Our understanding of the different cells involved uh, um, has really evolved over the time. We know that you know, everything stems from a hematopoietic stem cells, HSC, that give rise to what we call multipotent progenitors. These multipotent progenitors, they can give rise to different terminal end stage cells. And the, the, the decision tree they take on will depend on different external and internal cues, such as you know, transcription factors being turned on. And with technical advances, such as first flow cytometry, which allowed you to look at like a dozen protein, and then mass cytometry that allowed you to look at 40 protein, and recently 
single cell RNA sequencing approaches that allowed you to look at thousands of features, our understanding of this model went from a stepwise approach to a more continuous model. We actually now, it's very clear that this is, you know, full spectrum of cells, it's not black and white. For a long time, we thought that these HSCs were also homogeneous and now thanks to single cell readouts, we actually know they're heterogeneous. And there's now been a few studies, mostly focusing on RNA that have been starting mapping the full spectrum of cell states in the more viral data, uh, which capture both differentiating cells. You can see these are not distinct clusters, they're like they're, um, positioned along a trajectory, but also terminal cell states, which are the end of all these branches. So some of these advantages of using these more unbiased approaches that it enabled us to discover novel biology and states and understanding shift in frequencies of these cell states and health and disease. But there are challenges associated with so many data type, at least for you know, end users like myself. It becomes really hard to understand how cell populations are related to each other and how they relate from one data set to another produced by two different labs. There's also inconsistent methodology and nomenclature across different groups, which complicates um, the comparison and contrasting of the data. So why did this competition choose bone marrow? So it's one of the best studied stem cell system in modern biology. There's well-defined, at least N cell type and protein surface markers uh, that have been used by the immunology community for decades that can be used to help establish some initial ground truth. It's a continuous biological process Right, so we're not talking about discrete cell types, which means that we have an opportunity to, to tackle the problem of properly defining the full cell spectrum. It's also relevant for disease, so it's relevant to the broader community, right? We know that bone marrow defect can be associated with different developmental disease, cancer like leukemia and aplastic anemia. And from a technical standpoint, these cells can be commercially purchased uh, with appropriate um, ethical consents. There's actually reagents, which means that multiple lab side across different countries can work together towards tackling this problem for this competition. Um, and so I described you know, three main data types that are being generated. And so I wanna make the case from a biological standpoint, why, why are they all complementary? So, you know, as Ajila mentioned, RNA modalities are the most scalable right now. And they've been really key in what we call defining cell types, which are end stage, and what we call cell states, there's these cell subsets that are part of a spectrum. And we define them based on modules of genes that are more uniquely expressed to you know, a group of cells. The ataxic data is really key in helping defining these transitional states, because uh, ultimately these immune cell states are defined by transcription factors being up or down regulated. And in single cell data, these transcription factors are not really abundant, so they're really, really hard to detect and quantify. And protein data, which you will get through the sexy data sets, enables you to leverage the legacy markers that has been used by the community of immunologists for decades. So it also helps us comparing the results to published literature and defining our ground truth. And so these three complementary modalities will ultimately help provide a more complete and accurate definition of cell type identities and cell state spectrum. So this is the data set. So it includes nine different donors, all of which were bone marrow mononuclear cells that were profiled across four different sites. And, and you can see that donor one was actually profiled across the four different sites, which enables you to start tackling the question of technical noise. Uh, black circle represents the readout of um, attack seek and gene expression uh, co-measurement, and the triangle represents uh, single RNA seq measurements together with the measurements of 134 proteins. You can also see that then different sites had, whoops, sorry about that, different individuals that were profiled, which enables us to then look into biological variability. So we have a data set that is tackling both technical and biological variability across data types. And so this, this is a snapshot of some of the data that was uh, analyzed for ground truth. Um, this, uh, these are UMAP uh, embedding for donor one, generated by site one. Um, every dot is a single cell. The color scheme represents a, a unique identity or predicted cell types, which was defined by a set of uniquely expressed genes or uniquely set of open chromatin. And, and so these markers were defined through both unbiased approach 
as well as legacy markers. So for those of you who don't think in the space of single cell, here you have the same U map where we did feature plots. So cells are pseudo colored according to the gene expression level of specific genes. So I just want to give you a sense of how we go sometimes about figuring out if a set of genes are uniquely expressed or not. So VCAN, for example, is more specifically expressed in the bottom clusters. These happen to be mononuclear phagocytes. Bank one is a key marker for B cell, is expressed mostly on the cluster on the right. CD247 is a key marker for lymphocytes. You can see it's, it's expressed on the island at the around 6 p.m. And HBA1 is a key marker for erythrocytes. And then obviously we need to do this a bit more systematically, but just to give you a sense of how we can assign some of the cell identity, which have now these markers have been summarized through these um, dot plot. So the color of the dot gives you a sense of the mean expression in a specific group and the size of the dot that tells you which fractions of the cells in that groups express the marker. So you have here um, some highlights of the key markers. Here every column is a marker that are specifically expressed in specific cell subsets uh, defined on every column. And you have the RNA on the left and the attack on the right. On the same U map, you can also start looking at cell trajectory or the cell spectrum I talked about. And so here you have an example of erythrocyte developmental stage um, that are co color coded here in pseudotime ordering from yellow to dark blue. And, and so we can also start looking into this type of cell spectrum in both the RNA space and the ataxy space. Just to highlight, I mentioned earlier that data set was designed to capture both biological heterogeneity and technical noise. And I wanna show some example about that. So uh, here we have six samples that uh, were generic, generated across two sites, site one, the first three, and site two on the right. And this is for a multi ohm data. So we're talking about RNA-seq and ATAC-seq. And these bar plot, every color represents one of these different cell type. And, and then you have the thickness of the buttons with the frequency of the cell type. And so I want to bring your attention right away to sample one, which was processed on site one and site two. And you can see that the distribution of cells of the exact same frozen sample processed at two different sites actually is different. You have way more monocytes, for example, this blue bar and site two than you have on site one. This captures some of the technical noise we talked about. Um, Similar, and this is for um, uh, single cell RNA seq and attack data. You have something, I want to highlight an example of biological variability. This is two samples for site seq data, so protein and RNA. Samples were generated, processed at site one, and you have two different samples. And so here, right, taking again these monocytes as an example, sample one had way more monocyte at sample two, and you can just look at the you know, color spectrum, they're quite different. And so immune cells frequencies do vary greatly between donors that are present at the same site. And that needs to be taken into account when you do your data integration. And, and, and together, this type of heterogeneity and noise, they do create a challenge for self-type annotation. So I'll finish with the wish list or, and challenges from the biological uh, community perspective. Um, you know, clustering and subclustering, which I, I didn't go into detail about this, but we know we first define the main cell subsets, and then we do iteration of subclustering to try to define all of the granular definition of these cell types. It's pretty labor intensive the way we do it, uh, because it, as uh, John mentioned, it requires expert knowledge, and myself, I'm not scalable. You know, we all have certain bandwidth. But it's actually really essential right now to define novel cell types and states to create a reference map, a reference map across tissues that ultimately will empower developing more automated tools. Because um, right now the automated classifications that people are using, such as tools developed by your community, often misses rare immune cell types as well as new cell states. Defining what's a predicted stable cell spectrum, right, that, that can be generalized across patients despite the change in, in frequencies is pretty challenging right now. Linking the cell spectrum across different data types, so being able to predict, you know, in the attack seek space from RNA space or protein um, is pretty challenging, and which, which, is, a, which is one of the problems pa paused um, by this challenge. 
we need to standardize our nomenclature for the way we define these uh, states and have a more systematic approach for data integration that could relate eventually to legacy knowledge, which I hope this challenge will help solve. And finally, you know, this is all about multimodal data. And I do believe multimodal data will be essential to achieve a more complete definition of a cell type. Uh, one of the main challenge as an end user is the computational scalability that needs to be overcome in the years to come. Because right now at this stage where we are, experimentalists like myself can produce data way faster than they can be analyzed. We are, just to give you an example, we now have data sets that are approaching 5 million cells across different modalities. And none of the tools out there are computationally scalable to tackle their analysis. So with that, I'll let Daniel introduced the, the challenge. Okay, great. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Burkhart. Uh, as mentioned, I'm a machine learning scientist at Celerity. I work with John Bloom. Uh, and I'm really excited to tell you a little bit more detail about the NeurIPS competition that we're hosting this year. Um, as a little bit of background, the way that this whole effort started for me was uh, during my PhD at Yale, working with Smitha Krishnaswamy, working to put together a course uh, to teach how to do single cell analysis to biologists. We started to review the literature on what are the best practices in the field. And we came across this excellent review uh, by Malta Lucan and Fabian Tice that looked at dozens of benchmarks in um, published studies and, and published alongside new methods to understand what are the best steps for normalization and, and through processing and downstream analysis. And we realized looking at a lot of these papers that different benchmarks, even within the same field, were using different metrics, different test sets. Um, they were doing the benchmarks all very independently and they weren't updated over time. It made it difficult thinking, you know, this is great, this happened once, but how are we going to make sure that we can continue to learn what's the best way to approach problems in single cell analysis in the future? At the same time, um, I think we were really inspired by some of the findings uh, in machine learning using centralized benchmarking. And so this is actually a paper published on uh, a comparison of metric learning papers where you take a data set uh, embedded into lower dimensions and then try to preserve certain structural relationships, uh, for example, between classes and the data sets. And um, what these researchers did is looked at the published literature uh, using a set of standardized data sets even, but looking at the benchmarks as presented in the papers themselves and found that if you just look at um, the literature, you'd see a steady increase in performance over time. Um, but what they did was set a standardized training regime, uh, set up hyperparameters and pre-processing of the data and found that actually performance had not changed as dramatically as the literature might have uh, led you to, to expect. And so uh, Smitha and I, along with another graduate, then graduate student of the lab, Scott Gigante, uh, reached out actually to Malta and Fabian Tice and also uh, Angela Pisco and Olga Botvinnik, who is then at Biohub as well, uh, to come up with this idea for open problems and single cell analysis. And so the idea for this project was to take this common task framework, although we didn't necessarily use those words at the time, to standardize the way that benchmarking is done in single cell analysis. And the way that we defined this effort was to come up with a set of core features that we wanted to offer. We wanted to have formally defined tasks that anyone could look at and understand exactly what it is that we're trying to achieve. We wanted to have data sets that were easy to access and had a standardized format, along with mathematically defined metrics to rank performance of different methods and also encourage new people to submit different metrics to this centralized benchmarking. Uh, we also wanted to make sure this was a place that method developers could then upload their own methods to and have them run in exactly the same way on a set of standardized data sets. And the one thing that we've been lacking since we started this in early 2020 was this um, core element of the, of the common task framework, which is a private test set, which is something that is very common in machine learning, but is much rarer in biology. And I'm actually not aware, although I could I'd be happy to hear that I'm wrong, if there are uh, private test sets in single, of single cell data. And I certainly don't think that there are for multimodal. And so we were really excited to be able to expand this um, 
this project into a NURPS competition in 2020 focused on multimodal single cell data for all of the reasons that we've talked about already, especially with this idea that now we have a private test set. And I think this is a really great um, proving ground for the project to make sure we're building up infrastructure and that we're really encouraging the community to come and, com and compete and, and submit methods. So the way that, uh, as John mentioned, we set this up is in, into a series of three tasks. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time um, describing how each of these tasks are set up in some more detail. The first task is modality prediction, where the goal is to predict one modality from another. Here I'm just showing predicting um, RNA from attack accessibility values, but we do this actually in all combinations of directions, RNA to attack, attack to RNA, site to RNA, and back. This is consistent uh, across all of the tasks. I'm just gonna show you one here. The way we set this task up, is that you are given a set of competitors are given a set of cells where they have some uh, modality measurements known for a collection, and then for in that same cell, we know we measured a second modality, but the values there are hidden. In the training set, we provide both of the values, and the goal is given one of the modalities, predict the other. And the way that we can quantify this is using root mean square error on the data to compare how well do the predictions match the observed values? I think this is probably one of the most straightforward tasks in the competition. We know the exact values that we measured in the same set of cells, and we just wanna know for every single gene in the genome or every single protein that we measure or every uh, peak that we observed, uh, what is the value of that given one of the other uh, modalities in the same cell? The second task involves matching modalities. So this is a, um, a, a problem where users or competitors are now given two uh, sets of data, one set of accessibility profiles, for example, and then another set of uh, RNA uh, expression measurements. And the goal is to, um, is to identify which uh, accessibility profile matches which gene expression profile. And we think of this as a directional task. So given a set of RNA profiles, can you predict which is, which is the matching attack profile? So you'll see here, there is the output is this matching matrix where the rows sum to one and the values in each cell represent your confidence that a given profile was observed in the same cell as, a, as a, one of the other modality. This is, I think, really useful, especially when we're thinking about mapping reference atlases. We maybe have a large set of attack profiles that are measured in some system, and then we're measuring a new RNA measurement, and we want to predict what, what's the likely accessibility regions for that cell. Uh, and, the way, and then we can actually quantify this because we know for all of the cells in our test set what were the correct matchings because we observed them together. And so what we can do is take an average of the confidences put on each of the correct pairings here, RNA one matches attack profile three. Uh, this is uh, kind of similar to uh, looking at cross entropy, but you would say we want the score to go up if you do well, and we can determine how well you can do this kind of matching task. Finally, uh, we wanted to think a little bit beyond just doing a straight prediction and instead move in uh, to a problem of representation learning. And here we're giving competitors the full joint profiling data, but we're holding out some key metadata that we've spent a lot of time annotating like the cell cycle or cell types that we measure or trajectories in the data. And the task is to learn a reduced dimensionality of the data set. I'm realizing this says 50 here, but it should say 100. I forgot to update this slide. Um, but the goal is to, is to identify this reduced embedding where now actually we can quantify how well you uh, achieve two different sets of metrics, how well you preserve biology using correspondences between cell type labels and trajectories, for example. And then another set of measures around how well batches are removed by looking at latent mixing or graph connectivity. And so there's a full set, actually of six metrics that are defined on the competition website that I'll link to in a little bit. Uh, and I encourage you to go see the, the formal definitions there. But the idea is that we're going to try to weight both of these two things. So we can now come up with a joint embedding where we can perhaps do annotation together because the way that we had to do annotation for this uh, competition was looking at each of the modalities separately and we're really excited to see whether or not we can identify interesting new biology if we can come up with useful integrated representations. 
so as we came up with these uh, with these tasks, we started to think about how we would uh, identify effective baseline metrics. And the last you know bit of information I want to share with everyone here, I don't want to bias any particular kinds of approaches that we expect people are going to use. Um, I'm really excited to see exactly uh, what kind of diversity of methods uh, actually end up doing well in this competition. But one of the consistent things that we found when we started to explore the test data is that there's certainly a problem of batch effects, which is something that should not be at all surprising to folks uh, who have done single cell analysis in the past. So here we're looking at a UMAP on uh, RNA expression values for just four of the donors, four of the samples that we measure, two sites, two donors. Uh, and I, I think the main thing I want you to understand looking at the batches on the left or the cell types on the right is that there are certainly some clear uh, differences in terms of global gene expression between cells that we annotated the same way based off of the expert biology uh, that Chloe, Malta, and their teams helped us to annotate and, uh, and the representations that we're seeing here. So there, there are some batch effects we need to, um, we need to correct for. And this matches what, what we had observed when we found that it was actually kind of difficult for, for this match prediction, for this prediction task to, to do a good job predicting because being able to predict really well within donor one doesn't necessarily mean the same model will immediately be able to do well on donor two without any batch correction. We can look at the attack profiles and we see a similar pattern where there are not, there are some regions of, of these embeddings where we see that there is good mixing in between uh, multiple modalities, um, but not necessarily uh, the same kind of correspondences that, that uh, would suggest a perfect, um, a perfect mixing. And so we're really excited to see uh, how, that, how this works and to give you maybe a little bit of a, another view into it. One of the analyses we did is we looked at the variation within each of the donors relative to the mean of either that donor or the mean of a second donor. So within donor means, so the global mean within donor means take 20% of the cells from a donor and compare it to the mean of the remaining 80% of the cells. The cluster means are using those cell type labels that we looked at. And so if we just focus on this left uh, leftmost set of pair of columns First, what we can see is when you're looking at gene expression only within donor, there is higher correlation between those 20% of cells and the mean of the remaining 80% if you take the means within clusters and only do calculate those means within clusters versus across the entire data set. But when we look across donors, this doesn't happen. This means that when you, you the, uh, the cells of one sample are closer to the mean of the second donor than each of the individual clusters are to the relative means of clusters that were annotated as being the same cell type based off of known biology. And this, so this is unexpected. You should, if you do batch correction, what we hope we'll observe is that you'll see that the correspondences within the clusters will go up. And this pattern is observed also in attack, although to a lesser level. And we also see this in the site data, although I'm not gonna show that to you today. And so I just wanna make sure the competitors are aware that this pattern of noise is really important and something that we expect um, uh, competitors are gonna to have to address as they're uh, submitting methods for the competition. Um, I want to make sure that I uh, acknowledge that this is a project that has been a huge community effort. Uh, it's not been any one uh, set of individuals, but a large number of them. We've uh, had financial support from Slarity and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, who's had a very um, you know, wonderful track record of supporting community science and open science efforts like this. We're also really grateful to the other institutions that have been uh, generating data and helping to formalize the tasks. These are pictures of the, the core organizers I mentioned before, Smita, Fabian, Malta, Olga, Angela, and Scott Gigante. Uh, I'm also really excited that we've had support from Saturn Cloud, which is a, um, a cloud-hosted Jupyter environment to uh, enable folks to start working with this big data, these big data sets uh, for free online. Uh, and I'll show that in a second. Uh, data Intuitive has, has done a great job of providing infrastructure support. BioLendrid provided us with uh, some free antibody panels. And we've had uh, guidance from folks at Harvard Medical School, Mila, and UTH Zurich. 
Um, so this is live now. Anyone who's watching this can go to saturncloud.io, click on this NERPS open bio button, and it will create a resource on Saturn Cloud. Uh, you can actually, if you click this little intercom button and tell them open problem sent you, they'll upgrade the number of free hours you get to 100 a month. Uh, and if you need more, you can let us know and Saturn is happy to increase that if you need. Um, you can then launch a Jupyter server and start exploring the notebooks. And I'm just going to show you very briefly what that looks like. Um, so if you see here, this is Saturn Cloud. You can launch, a, you can click on this to create a new project, which looks like this. You then open the Jupyter Lab environment, which I've already done here. And then you should be directed to these two explore site data and explore multi-ohm data sets. Uh, notebooks, and this is all running on AWS, and you can start to look at uh, the data, which are sort of and data objects, start to play around with some visualization, uh, and we've also put in a baseline measure that you can use for uh, the first task of uh, modality prediction. Um, and so I really hope that by providing this resource, we'll be able to uh, enable more people to compete and work with this data than might uh, be able to do otherwise. And so um, with that, I'm going to leave you with our call to action, which is uh, if you'd like to get involved, I would uh, go to openproblems.bio slash neurips, click on the sign up button, provide your email address, and we'll send you updates throughout the course of the competition. There's a Discord server you can join and start to introduce yourself, find teams, talk about the task. The, um, the competition key dates this Friday, we're going to soft launch the competition, which means that all of the starter kits and task definitions are going to be made public. Uh, we need another week to make sure that we can actually start the development phase of the competition, which is going to be hosted on eval AI uh, and information about that will be you know, emailed to everyone who signs up here. Competitors will have about two months to work on developing methods for any of the three tasks. And each of the subtasks within them, we're going to announce winners in November ahead of uh, NeurIPS in the uh, in the beginning of December. And so I really appreciate uh, everyone's time. And I, I guess we're we're at ten o'clock, so um, I don't know if we we take questions or we go straight into the discussion now. Let's let's do any uh, any quick direct questions of a more technical nature because because the discussion um, is going to be maybe a bit more meta. Um, so. That, uh, yeah, I would, I, would, um, I would love to open that up quickly now first. And thank you all very much, Daniel, and all of you. Um. Hi, um, my name is Xing, and I come from Harvard Bioengineering Department. And I have a question about uh, the competition. Should one model that we submit finish all three tasks, or it uh, should only finish one task? Yeah, great question. Um, so there are three different tracks. Uh, one for each task. And so you submit one model. We submit one submission per task, but we know there are, I mentioned before, different directionalities. So for the prediction task, there's RNA to attack, and there's also R uh, attack to RNA, and there's independent prizes for each. And so you get to submit one uh, submission package, but you can upload multiple models in that package and compete on as many or as few of those uh, directions subtasks within each track. Does that answer your question? Yes, it did. Uh, and uh, I have another question is that, um, mm -hmm. can we use the competition results to frame a, 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 a paper or um, does this paper be necessary to be a new NIPS, NIPS paper? Uh, I'm not entirely sure I understand the question. You. The code needs to be submitted under an open source license. Um, okay. We do not uh, assume ownership over the code, although we reserve the right to use open source software in the same way that we would any other open source software. And we are not planning on publishing on any specific method, but we are planning on submitting a publication related to the overall event. And I think I want to be, I don't want to make any, you know, commit. I don't know exactly how we're going to do authorship on that yet. Um, but I think we 100% want everyone who's been a major contributor uh, to the efforts involved with assembling such a publication to be included 
there, whether it's through a consortium author list or directly named on, on papers. I mean, and, and I would just add individually, our, our great hope would be that people are inspired to create methods that they want to independently go publish on uh, and share. Um, yes. Because of this. That would be the ideal outcome. Okay, get what's it. So, okay. What's your prediction of how many um, entries you'll get? <laughs> we, 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 that is a separate machine learning task that we have not. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So what I can tell you is that Saturn Cloud is willing to support, um, you know, up to and around a thousand different competitors using their resources. So we've made sure that we're optimistic in terms of competitors to make sure that we can secure enough resources for computation. Uh, but yeah, I don't want to hazard a, a, a guess here. Is there any straw man performance that, you know, the simplest sorts of things we'll get? Yeah, so the starter kits that I mentioned all have baseline methods. So for example, for the, and, and these are also in the notebooks for the first task. So for example, for the base, for the prediction, one of the baseline methods is do PCA on both of the modalities and then train a linear regressor to predict between the PCA space and then do the inverse PCA transformation uh, on the predictions to go back to the original feature space so that it runs somewhat quickly. Uh, and that does better than the mean uh, of just the training data, um, not, but not by much. So I'm excited to see how people can do. Uh, Great question. People can improve on that. Okay. so. If it's all right, I think we'll, you know, in the interest of time, move into uh, the discussion. So this is going to be uh, like this whole session, actually, a little bit different from from usual. Uh, I just want to say, first of all, though, thanks again. Thanks so much, all, all of you, uh, for presenting this. It's it's great to see how you've collaborated to put the competition together, and very excited to see what comes out of it in the coming months. Um, so for the discussion, uh, we're also going to welcome Malta Lucan. Um, Malta is at the Institute for Computational Biology at the Helmholtz Center in Munich. And uh, Malta, do you want to quickly introduce yourself and say a word about your role in the effort as the other speakers did before their talks? Sure. Um, hey, my name is Malta Lucan. I'm at Helmholtz Center Munich. Um, my, my background is kind of data integration pipeline building, and I'm one of the core team members of the Open Problems um, and the NeurIPS competition together with, with Dan um, and everyone else who gave a talk. Um, and my role has in kind of overall coordination as well as leading data analysis pipelines. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Malta. Um, and so, so we're in terms of format. Um, there's not we're not going to have a sort of formal panel discussion, but I'm going to moderate and I'm going to ask questions and I'm going to get our guest speakers a chance to answer each question before opening it up to the audience. Uh, we're going to leave the recording on. Um, but if you want to contribute to the discussion and prefer not to appear, uh, just type into the chat and I'll do my best uh, uh, to relay your comment. Um, and I'll, 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 sh I'll say that the, um, the, the questions that I'm going to give uh, to use to frame the discussion uh, were, were generated by the MIA steering committee and some discussions that we had leading up to this session. Um, okay, great. So I, I'm just going to give a couple of framing points first to kind of um, well, to frame the discussion. So, so how does the scientific community choose research directions as a whole? Um, what are the benefits, the trade-offs and the consequences of the choices that we make? And how do we ensure that the process is democratic and addresses multiple perspectives? Who does the enterprise seek to benefit and who realistically stands to benefit? You can argue that projects like this um, in some way establish a norm and the norm you could argue is that we're doing resource intensive science. We collect a lot of data. Uh, we then do resource intensive computations to learn big parameter sets. And this norm could be perceived uh, particularly strongly by relative outsiders, such as the machine learning researchers to whom the challenge is targeted. Um, I'm gonna share one quote. Um, this is, this quote is about, you know, how do we define progress? What's a scientific model? What makes a model good? What makes a model better? Uh, the quote is from Richard Levins and Richard, Lewont Richard Lewontin, um, passed away last year's um, dialectical biologist, and I'll read it. Um, Contrary to the positivistic notion that a question is legitimate if it's logically well-defined, testable, and capable of being answered on its own terms without regard to application, 
We argue that a question is meaningful if what we do or feel is changed by the answer. Furthermore, it is often only by knowing what practice we're concerned with that we can frame the question in a meaningful way. So that brings me to my first question for the, for the discussion. So this challenge is, is fundamentally or, or mostly about predictive tasks. The question is why should the field or ML researchers in the field be organized around prediction as a primary mode of scientific output? And how might the results of this challenge change what we do in biology, informing our future experiments, approaches to understanding the behavior of cells, tissues and organisms in health and disease? Well, I, I guess I guess I'm not done. Do you want to go first? Alex, these are very broad and deep questions. Malta, do you yeah, want to say something first? Like and then I can talk to you. Intentionally <laughs> open-ended. This can go in any direction we'd like, you know. So yeah, maybe I can I can briefly uh, start. Uh, thanks, Chloe. Um, so that's a it's a super cool question. Um, and I think there's a really a lot of things we could say here um, in different directions. One of the things is that I think uh, it's important that the competition that we're framing at the moment is, is really not uh, trying to be rigid in terms of this is the only way to define these tasks and these are the only metrics. And I think that's where a lot of the drawbacks come in that you're kind of uh, um, framing uh, or that you kind of framed in your question is that if we are very rigid in like what type of question we should be asking, how we should be measuring this, then uh, you might limit yourself in terms of future exploration in all different directions. Um, what Dan mentioned in the end of the talk is kind of this open problems framework um, that we have been setting up for, I think it's like over a year now. Um, yeah, it's actually longer than I thought. Um, and so within that specifically, and uh, within this framework that, that we developed, you can add metrics, you can add tasks, you can add data sets. And so that, that the question that we can ask actually continues to evolve. We had uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, actually really long discussions for how should we phrase one of these tasks? Should it be directed, undirected? And I think that's an open question. We don't claim to have a solution to that. However, the task that we have we have at the moment is definitely one way of looking at these things uh, from a particular perspective, but it's important that this is open to changing and adapting with community input and community discussions that we're not limiting ourselves um, to a one set of metrics and, and one set of tasks. I may add to my, as like an end user who, you know, I guess that's why I was invited as an end user of these methods that are being developed. I tried to kind of build the case in my part of the presentation of why this was so needed by the entire biological community using this type of data. So of course I speak in the name of humanologists, but in reality, um, these frameworks are applicable to any type of cell type, any type of tissue. And we are getting into a phase right now where, you know, we are out, the data product production is outpacing um, the development of new methods that can actually tackle this type of data type. And that's a huge problem. John mentioned how expensive this data generation is. And, you know, we're going a little blindly right now generating data without knowing if we're like designing our experiments properly for some of these batch corrections that are associated with multimodal data because we actually don't know how our experimental de design are affecting multimodal data generation. We know how they're affecting single data model modalities. And so there's, there's a huge need. And it's actually great to have an outside quote unquote community to those who think about just single cell biology to think about these problems because your community of machine learning have solved some of these problems using other data type. And, and so we need people who think differently to come up with creative solutions. And to Malta's point, I like how you frame this as like an open framework, right? The matrix that are currently being used in the, the methods development on the biological setting are often, not exactly tackling the actual biological challenges we, we have. They're very much focused on some of these competing metrics. And so if any of you, as you tackle these data sets, have new ideas for metrics that can better predict the accuracy of these methods, these would be so welcomed across a community that englobes thousands of investigators. So we need you all to tackle this problem. And I can expand on this, but I want my colleagues to also pitch in. Yeah, I think I would add that um, it's true that there's a very predictive 
nature to this because we're trying to you know make something measurable and uh, so we can do comparison in a more sort of objective way of course the downside of that is um at, on the surface it's much more focused on um sort of an what might feel like arbitrary notions of accuracy rather than um sort of uh succinct mechanistic new understanding of a cellular process um so a couple points around this the tasks that we started with they all do have some practical nature to them um you know the expense of creating this data means we're probably you know it'll be much continue to be much easier and cheaper and more accessible to make say uh transcriptional data and to the extent that we can predict other modalities um, from transcriptional data we could make it uh more accessible to for the community to learn more particularly if we're putting out public data sets on which these these kinds of methods can be trained i think an anal analogy uh that you'll appreciate alex is statistical genetics is where you know the thousand genomes project another larger efforts with whole genome sequencing that's clearly more had you know historically much more expensive um enabled people to use genotype arrays and impute uh quite a bit more information um that has been useful in uh you know medical and statistical genetics without having to always do whole, whole genome sequencing um you know the second task it's again prediction about matching but there are going to be a lot of single modality data sets attack and rna measured in the same system we'll want to bring to bear methods that can treat them jointly so we need to know how to integrate them um, and the third task, we try to make more representational um, and, and more toward what, what Chloe's worried about, which is, you know, how do we automate annotation because we can't keep up. And it's clearly like a key biology question is what are the cell types? What are the cell states? How do we think about it? Um, and, and, you know, to the extent that people can become uh, creative in finding measurable ways to um, assess some notion of representation and understanding, I think that's a very exciting direction for how we can engage machine learning in more than just what feels like, you know, accuracy of predictions without understanding. Um, it's really hard and it, it kind of confronts biology with, you know, so, biology historically is a fairly squishy thing relative to computer science, right? And, and no, no offense, Chloe. Um, and, um, and there is certainly, it's certainly not true that all biology should suddenly operate in this mode. It's not that any of us think that that this is how all biology should be done. Um, but at the moment, you know, you look at NeurIPS, there's basically only one example of a competition that's biology related. And even that was just, you know, based on batch correction of images. This is really the first time that uh, single cell biology is, has, has really been, um, I think, brought in front of the machine learning community. I think it's worth seeing where that can lead. It's um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of smart people uh, in all these fields that might have interesting ideas, and it may be that these kinds of questions can help machine learning get more creative um, in in its method development as well. And the other, the final thing I'll say is like, there are definitely examples where prediction um, has led to understanding. Um, a lot of science for most of history has been trying to just look at the world around us and, and create theories that can explain what we see right like um now often these theories can have like just a few you know f equals ma is like a very succinct explanation of of, of what's going on and, and we'd love to get to that point for for how cells work um i don't think we're there yet um and you know i think it's an open question whether enough data with you know, the right models can, in a data-driven way, elucidate these kinds of mechanisms and rules. I think it's not hopeless um, that increasing performance will depend on increasing, incorporating, you know, strong biological knowledge and inductive biases, but it's not guaranteed. Like the best methods, just like the best Go players uh, <laughs> these days on computer, you, you, you don't really, don't really understand the rules they're, they're using to win at Go. So, these are hard problems that we have to, to, to face, but I don't think, um, I, I mean, I, I think the, the way, the, 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 it's better to sort of face them in an, op, in, in an open way with, with people being able to, you know, take this, this data set and come up with all, all kinds of other ways to think about how it can be useful. Um, so this NeurIPS competition is in some ways just a, a kind of starting point, is, I think is how we see it.
Yeah, and if I can just add one quick point on, on top of this, I think just in terms of the first part of the question of like who decides how we do science, like one of the things that's just been really important to the organizers of open problems and like I want to also make sure everyone here is aware of is like we want anyone who's interested in giving us feedback or has advice or wants to start getting more involved to come in. Um, we had a jamboree in March with about 60 people who attended and one of those people ended up actually telling us the infrastructure we were using wasn't as uh, accessible to developers from the R community and that he had a solution that would fix that for us. And that's now the backbone of the NURBS competition. Another one of those competitors emailed you know, Malta and, and us saying, hey, like you guys are biasing your task three towards a particular set of models. And we've decided now to change the way that we do prizes to award separately for two different kinds of classes. I think like I really anyone who has feedback here, we really want to hear um, you know sort of any you know, what what that is, and and we'll, and we will you know promise to to listen and and consider it carefully. And I thank you for all those great points. Um, I'm going to open this up uh, to the audience now. Um, there's a comment in the chat uh, from Gok Chen who, who says he's happy to be named, but uh, can't uh, speak into the Zoom right now, so I'll just read it. Uh, I think what is predictive of what by itself can be very informative, even if uninterpretable or black box models are used. For example, learning that some cells or genes are less predictable or perfectly predictable might shift the focus to these populations or gene programs to design follow-ups and understand why. Thank you for that, Gok Chen. So, oh, sorry, someone else about Go ahead, Ray. Okay. So I want to call back to something that John talked about, which is, we didn't talk, well, I talked a little bit directly about, which is the balance between sort of interpretability and prediction, right? That these, ta and the particular tasks here are set mostly as pre with a predictive focus. Um, the sort of, the fundamentals of biology and what we're trying to like, you know, biological progress is, is interpretability or models that are understandable that make sort of biologically meaningful predictions about changes and mechanisms and, and, you know, build up our understanding sort of almost our qualitative, even more than our quantitative understanding of how cells behave. Uh, and you also mentioned that this is a starting point. But it's also a starting direction, right? We're saying here is some data that we could do a whole bunch of cool things with. And these are the initial things we're going to do with that data, or we would like people to do with that data with a very strong predictive focus and an emphasis on uh, existing approaches. Well, sort of not necessarily emphasis on this, but sort of an implied emphasis on or expectation of you're going to use, you know, deep models or, or you know, autoencoders and things like this. Are those the right models to be emphasizing, even implicitly? These are very hard to interpret, right? Linear models are not interpretable. Anything beyond linear are, you know, are very hard to, sorry, linear models are difficult to interpret. Anything beyond that are impossible to interpret for the most part. So given that, that, that you know, how, and, and this goes back to that question, how do we decide what, what sort of science to do? If we're pushing towards prediction and we're relying on uninterpretable models, how do we expect to, to pull this back to, to biology, to understanding of, of what's actually going on? What are the qualitative interactions within cells, with, between cells and different cell types? Um, I don't know the answer. I mean, this is just this is an open area of research in 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 models and prediction and deep models in particular, everywhere. And for the most part, the the answers so far have been somewhat disappointing. I think from a from a the perspective of a biologist. I think one answer could be that if you do get predictability 
then perhaps you also get control so that you can try to seek certain results through your experiments. It's another tool available. So you're no worse off if you have predictability. I mean, uh, from the biologist perspective, you know, the data analysis for, for us is just the first step. So anything that's predicted needs to be validated. And, and, and so this is where multimodal data helps, especially if you have surface protein that you can either predict or analyze in an integrated manner, because then we have tools to validate this prediction through perspective isolation, that's when you cell type or functional validation. And that's a big, big action item in the broader humans atlas community. It's one thing to predict that you have a new cell type or in cell states, another thing to convince people that this is actually true. Um, and, and, and so that needs to be part of some of the future metrics of um, how we interpret the data. But you're right that this has been disappointing thus far. I also think we just didn't have the right type of data sets to develop these type of metrics. And this is actually a decent data set to start with, even how it was conceived. One comment that comes to mind when thinking about this is, will there be general principles that we can find in the non-interpretable models. Because yes, the models might perceive, we might not be able to interpret them, but if we can identify common principles on the ones that are able to predict well the, the task and the different data types that we're looking at, I think that will hopefully allow us to push forward on the on the understanding. This is more just like a, a thought and a comment than, than really an answer. But I, I would like to, to see the field also thinking about after we have this competition and we have all the different models, we, we're gonna have a large pool, which is much bigger than what typically we have when some, some group will just put a publication in isolation. And so bringing this all together and hopefully interpreting and just reconsolidating what is common, what is different, what is, what's giving the advantage edge. I think it will be an interesting um, application to, to look after the competition. So I think if, please go ahead. Oh, okay, thanks. You know, I think one thing that's come up a couple of times with regards to a focus on predictive tasks is that there they could lead to other things that are not predictive tasks downstream. Um, and I think part of the idea is that there is, as sort of Alex mentioned in the framing, a norm being established where we maybe mostly just focus on the predictive tasks. Um, and I think that's part of what we wanted to raise from the steering committee perspective is that we have an opportunity to think critically. Is that the direction of science that we want? A primary focus on predictive tasks or how much of our resources should we devote to things other than predictive tasks? It's of course not the case that prediction is entirely useless and no one is arguing that we should never do that. Um, but to the extent that we're saying it's useful for these downstream things, there might be resources that we sort of directly um, you know, sort of put into whatever we think those downstream things are. Uh, David mentioned maybe control systems. Um, and, you know, just to sort of get back to something John said, that most of science has been about understanding the world, maybe rather than prediction. I think also relating back to a quote that Alex read and to paraphrase uh, a famous quote specifically with regards to philosophy, the, the point is not to describe the world, the point is to change the world. Um, we're, not, we're not merely here to you know, write out a description of what exists in the world, um, but hopefully to change it in some meaningful way. Um, but I do think something that needs to be recognized and acknowledged by the community is that you know, while we can point from prediction to other things downstream that might be useful, especially with regards to changing how we think or what we do, there are in fact real incentives baked into, well, since we're having a very sort of meta discussion here, the way we run society, for why prediction focused science is in fact the goal, rather than say a theory being the output of science. 
So being able to predict things, uh, and in particular, uh, you know, this relates to, well, in a super annoying economic sense, producing things that are ownable. You know, there are real incentives for doing science in that particular way as producing thing, as opposed to producing things that are maybe more democratic, like a theory. So for example, you can imagine like what we're gonna pass down to the next generation and passing down a theory, you know, that can easily be communicated from generation to generation or across the globe, but large parameter sets that predict on a particular data set are not particularly easy to communicate and are in some sense sort of more ownable. There is kind of a more narrow point to be made on that as well, but it relates to the same issue that the prediction that might achieve a good score in these competitions might learn something specific about the data set. That's kind of always going to be true. So, you know, for example, we might find models that are particularly good at classifying different immune cell types, but who's to say if those are any kind of useful for or are sort of the best models for classifying neurons. Relatedly, I think there was a lot of very good points made about the kind of formidable batch effects that exist in this data set. And things that sort of eliminate batch effects in this data set could very easily, especially because we're not expecting those, or maybe the first inclination will not be that those are going to be sort of interpretable models re removing the batch effects. Those I would worry would be, you know, particularly sort of overfit to the batch effects that exist in this data set and be unclear if that's gonna to generalize to move it, removing batch effects in any data that you're ever going to collect. So now that I've said all that, I do wanna say that, again, this is, not, this is not just to like criticize this specific challenge or this specific work, the data sets are cool, the problems are cool. It's more to like take an opportunity to think about broad picture and about these underlying issues and the way we do science. And something we didn't really get into is of course about who benefits from the science that we do as well. Brian, th thank you for those points. I think they're excellent. So if I can maybe bring it a little bit back uh, to the practical level um, of this particular task that we're talking about, um, or the, the tasks. Um, in terms of prediction, I think I really like what, what Gökshin was saying is that we can actually learn quite a lot from a purely predictive task as well. And I think the question also, has to be has to arise kind of what like what level of interpretability uh, do we require here? Um, in this the particular tasks we're talking about, like the interpretation we would like to have is essentially how gene regulation works or how regulatory networks work to go from one view of the biology, let's say in, in open chromatin and attack to RNA or to protein. Um, there are a lot of players which we don't measure that are involved in this regulatory process and that we cannot measure um, yet. And so we probably are actually still quite far away from even may being able to make a fully interpretable um, model that is linear that exactly explains what actors are performing what to get to the final solution. And so if we have even um, nonlinear methods, let's say deep learning approaches that are much more difficult um, to get anything out of in terms of interpretability, um, that's probably the, the feasible, um, the, fee the only feasible model we can do, uh, we can have to start predicting something in this framework where we don't measure a lot of things and actually there's just indirect interactions there. Um, and then the question is like, how much of that can we still interpret, right? We can start looking at compartment, like feature importance within that to start then getting hypotheses for further validation. Um, and one thing I wanted to bring it back to as well is that um, the, the batch effects, the scenario with batch effects coming from kind of a background in protein-protein interaction networks um, it's, it's, it was kind of shown already like five, 10 years ago that um, looking at, like if you actually get a, a, mod, um, a predictive model that uses kind of biologically informed um, features, let's say proteins that interact with one another, the performance of that across different batches that are unseen um, perform, like it, it's much better than a model that is you know, learned fully on a batch where you do not, uh, on several batches, and then doesn't like generalize as well to kind of hold out batches. In our um, test scenario, we specifically have, and I think that's ask, asking the question as well, uh, we're trying to have like a holdout test site, which is a completely unseen test, uh, an unseen batch. And so hopefully, I mean, you, that might also guide kind of the methods towards performing much better if they do capture underlying biology better in a method, in a way that might be easier to interpret than a completely black, black box.
Thanks, Malta. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I, I, we can go another few minutes. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to read the second question. Uh, I, I'm not sure we'll get to all of them, but we have actually touched on points relevant to all of them. Um, can we imagine a challenge designed to engage ML researchers in the field around modes of scientific output other than prediction? So I guess like um, to talk a little bit more about this, like uh, idea of unhealthy bias towards prediction. I think one of the like fundamental aspects of science is its ability to make predictions. And I think that there's a little bit of, there's a distinction I think between like, I think we're making between uh, uninterpretable model making predictions and an interpretable model making predictions. But that in general, like the success of any theory is its ability to make predictions about the observable universe. And that if it does not make predictions about observable universe, it's not science. Like mathematical proofs can be true, but I don't think that they're science in the same way that making predictions based off of an equation of the motions of celestial bodies is science. Um, and so I, I just, I think that I 100% agree that like what we really would love to have are these elegant gene regulatory networks where we can, you know, go in and easily remove a single edge and then predict exactly what's going to happen so that we can, you know, if we want to better understand disease, for example, go in and modify that and target it very specifically and you know, cure a particular illness. I think that um, these kinds of predictions around perturbations are incredibly interesting. And I think, you know, one of, as John mentioned, this idea of alpha fold, being able to predict like the change of a substitution of amino acid is also especially interesting. But I think like there, I, I don't know, I just, this is my, my general reaction to, to, to the idea of, of being, like prediction is the primary output of science, I think. It's whether or not we, how much we care about whether or not the model that we're using to make the prediction is uh, understandable by us because we seem to have more trust of things that we can understand. Um, and we're not sure if that's like necessary, that bias towards like necessarily being able to understand limits the utility of the model for investigation, right? If I had a, if I had a black box that could predict perfectly what would happen every time that I added uh, a particular drug or knocked out a gene or turned on a gene in a cell, it would expedite science tremendously because I wouldn't have to go and do those predictions. I could then just study the results of the model. If they're perfectly faithful to the cell at a scale that I can't do in the wet lab um, because I need to get cells from patients or mice or what have you. Um, and so that I think is, is, is really exciting and being able to do those kinds of in silico predictions, um, I think are, are a very important kind of, of scientific output uh, that we're maybe like not talking about in the same way as we would predictions of like a mechanistic model. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. So I just want Brian. to ahead, just, just to directly respond and, and kind of reiterate, I, I mean, I think there is and uh, this is not to say anyone's right or wrong, just to highlight the fact that there exists sort of in this specific case, fundamental disagreements about what the output of science is or should be, where I, I very strongly believe that the sort of important output of science and that the theory, the sort of product of science is something uh, when it's useful that changes how we think or what we do, it changes the world in some way. And a sort of valid scientific theory is not simply something that produces predictions, it is not simply something that describes the world. Here's a list of values that exist in the world, right? Here's the number of leaves that exist in the world. Here's the number of grains of sand that exist in the world. But it's something, again, that changes how we think and what we do in the world. Um, so, again, I don't, that's not, that's my particular opinion, and I'm not. I, the, 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 the idea is just to highlight that there are different approaches to science and there are different ways that people think about science, things like this, or not just this, there are many different projects that are sort of establishing a norm that's very much going in the sort of predictive direction and the resource intensive 
science direction. And it's not that those are useless. Not, nobody's saying that. It's just, again, we want to highlight the fact that there are kind of other ways of thinking, other opportunities, um, or and to think critically about not only what the benefits of this direction of science are, but what we might be missing out on. That's the idea. Yeah, Brian, I, I think um, I like your framing of, of um, you know, understanding that that also leads to impacts in the world, right? Um, and and um, I don't think you'd argue that if we could perfectly simulate a cell and how it would react to every possible intervention and do that at the level of tissues in, a, in an organism, that wouldn't have incredible impact in the world. Um, even if we didn't, even if we didn't understand how, I think how it's doing it. I, I think that probably part of the 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 what the, the, I think a really a really hard question to answer is um, many of the things that happen in science are trying to progress us in that direction, right? Uh, to to understand how cells work and and I mean in biology at least um, and and how organisms function and differentiate and disease and health and so on in order to leverage that for, for also impact on human lives. Um, and what is like the route to, to, to be able to understand what will happen if I do this to this other thing? Um, it's not an easy leap to go from a black box model, right? To, to, to uh, an explanation that is more causal and and succinct and generalizable, and it very well could be that investing too many resources in improving prediction would detract attention from other approaches that might more directly assess um, mechanism. And and pretty much surely, learning real causality will require clever thinking about um, experimental design that is not just measure a baseline system. By a bunch of modes and try to infer relationships between them, um, like you know your work on compressed sensing, you know, is a really interesting way to think about how we could do more experiments where we have hypotheses, we intervene, and we measure what happens uh, more scalably. And I think part of your motivation, I'm guessing, is because you can test mechanistic hypotheses, you know, more directly, um, and, and then you can build those one upon the other to build a, a better understanding. I, I don't mean to put words in your mouth on, on that last part, but I'm, I'm curious if any of that uh, sort of resonates. Sorry, yes, I don't wanna expand too much because I've been talking too much overall, but yeah. Great, um, I guess uh, maybe partly just to sort of frame on the other end, and I don't think we have a lot more time um, Let's say we'll go until 10:45. I'll read the last two questions together, and they—they, they, uh, you know, Brian has already alluded to some of these ideas, and, and others have as well. Um, so, who participates in deciding how we do science and determining what constitutes progress? What are the scientific and social consequences of a heavy focus on resource-intensive science? Who stands to gain and who might be excluded? And also, who benefits from the outputs of science? So, if the product again is a theory that can be tested and understood and interpreted and applied. That's somewhat different from a predictive model based on a large parameter set that can be in some sense owned uh, and, and who reaps the benefit of such ownership. And to, to tie that back a little bit to like, you know, science, you know, coming up with something that changes what we do as scientists, uh, as biologists, how, you know, what we want is, you know, particularly how do we cure disease, right? That's for the most part, what all of us are here for, right? This data is certainly something, you know, that can, we can learn, you know, to, to understand more about disease, but an entirely predictive model without necessarily a biological understanding underneath can tell me that someone, yes, if I make this change in this gene's expression, it will go into it a state that's more diseased or the balance of cell types will be different or something like that. But it doesn't, like how, the step from that to, all right, how do I cure? You know, what are the steps necessary to cure? Is it, is, uh, and you know, getting to that cure 
understanding of the bio the sort of biological underpinnings of disease is critical right and that's i think really what personally i'm interested in as an interpretable model one that tells me okay this is what you need to change these are the ways you need to influence these cells to bring them back to a healthy state that's that's my own personal interest in and emphasis on interpretable models is what is the state that I can maybe influence? What is the transcription factor that's not binding where it needs to? Can I improve that through increasing expression of the transcription factor, et cetera, et cetera? What possible drug might work? So. I mean, that's an important angle. I will just say that, you know, to be very pragmatic, that to be able to achieve such predictions, you also need to analyze the right and relevant clinical samples and tissue samples. And that's normally not just blood, which is what people do. It's actually the right tissue at the right time point and the right treatment regimen across samples that, that have been clinically extremely well phenotyped. Um, it's kind of the next step, but trying to establish new methods for data integration, it, it kind of needs to be done in a simpler data set that doesn't have all the noise, biological noise associated with the disease is kind of the first step, um, right? Because it's actually really hard to do methods development in the context of disease. And you don't know what's, what's, really, inter what's really technical noise versus biological noise. But I mean, for what it's worth, I'm with you. <laughs> That's the whole reason I'm in this field. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And um, the, right, in order to, to sort of decide how to intervene, it helps to, to sort of characterize what's different, right? In, in health and disease, it's not the end of the story, but to characterize it, we want to make measurements. And until recently, you know, a lot of those measurements were just looking in a microscope, and now we can look at the molecules and cells and these different levels. It's very exciting. Um, but the technologies we use to even do these measurements, right, are, are so complicated and the measurements are sparse and there's high dimensionality and there's, you know, so many other factors that even just getting a better handle on what exactly we're measuring here that is truly the biological state versus all the rest, that part is something that maybe machine learning has demonstrated some ability, you know, to do, um, even if, uh, you know, then then answering questions like, okay, so now what exactly do we change to get the outcome we want, is is a m much harder kind of problem, um, uh, where machine learning, uh, just because it succeeded on learning from big data to make purely predictive, you know image labeling much better or language translation or, or so on, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's less clear, um, right? Um, that doesn't mean like uh, we shouldn't try and we shouldn't bring all kinds of other tools to the table and ultimately being able to do experiments and iterative experiments, right? Where you, where you, you model, you think, you, you decide what's the next data to, to make an experiment to do. Um, it's not going away. <laughs> like I can't. Um, I I think um, you know that that leap to okay, fine. We we kind of have a, another characterization. Now how do we leverage that and discover new treatments that actually going to translate and work? Um, is uh, it's it's hard and 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 you know Celerity and a bunch of other you know biotechs are also thinking about this problem and. Um, I think it it's exciting, but like if you can't do experiments that are basically driven by hypotheses along the way in order to refine them and 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 you know try these drugs or knock this out and do it in the right tissues and, and at the right scale um, with the right training data, it's 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 pretty hard, and you can't do it without biologists. <laughs> like, um, and it's also a hard problem how to have the different communities who think about these problems um, from different angles, um, whether someone's coming from machine learning or biology or math or somewhere in between, 
um, to have productive conversations uh, that that lead to like really defining what matters and then and then putting yourself in a position to begin to measure it. It doesn't mean prediction is the only thing, but if we can't come to terms with some way of kind of quantifying or measuring what we think is um, important, even if it's not measure as in a number, but just we know what it means to have made progress and learned something together, um, then you know we can make models all day and night and they'll improve on something, but you know, do we care? So anyway, it resonates a lot um, what you're saying, Ray. And I, I, um, it's a it's just an interesting time <laughs> that we're in. Well, and and I'm not trying to be negative. I'm trying to ask the question. I think really, how do we design metrics or incentives or whatever towards these more relevant? That might be a loaded word, but more maybe useful. Uh, biologically speaking, medically speaking, how do we does how you know how, just is it possible even to come up with metrics, incentives, directions of research from data like this and 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 from experiments like this that lead us in that direction? I think it's hard. I think it's extremely hard to to like prediction. Yes, okay, it's easy to come up with metrics. There are hundreds of metrics you can choose from, uh, but something that's you know tell me what drug to treat a given disease for right and 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 i think it will come back to ground truth so it was probably more relevant right to ask okay i've developed this wonderful in vitro model system or this mouse model like the prediction task of a disease and the prediction task is predict the small molecule or knockout or whatever that that is going to uh resolve it block it or 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 or, or resolve it right like now to do that task <laughs> at scale um, is, uh, I mean, to generate ground truth like that at scale is is um, really expensive. And in some sense, predict a drug that's going to pass the clinical trial and actually help patients. Now we're talking, you know, we need ten years and a billion dollars or whatever, right? Like, um, and so anything that I guess one way I've begun to look at it, particularly in the last couple of years, is we're always going to be in this situation where we have much more kind of in vitro metrics of improvement, sort of the within data set validation stuff that's not really ultimately where the application is. That's going to be bigger scale. The data, you know, it, it's, it's, and I'm, I'm using in vitro in the like in vitro in vivo clinical sense, but I, I don't mean it just there. It's just an analogy. Um, we're going to have more sort of truth data to frame scalable prediction tasks, if you will. Um, at the farther end from application and the closer we get toward you know the task of predict the exact thing to do to cure this person right it's just going to get narrower and narrower and like most of machine learning will have less and less to say about it um however if you think of that kind of like a funnel um maybe machine learning can play a bit a bigger role at the beginning and saying, well, which experiments that are quite expensive because they were going to require patient samples or lots of mice or animals or, or just like growing up a lot of cells or whatever, like which, which experiments should be prioritized? And then when we see what happens, well, now can we integrate that, learn something, maybe even something truly everyone would consider a new biological understanding of a tissue or system. And, and now, decide what to do next. So kind of optimal experimental design, right? Yeah, I like I, this active learning framework, uh, but kind of in a meta sense for, for science as a whole. Um, sorry, to, John, to cut you off. Uh, no, no, that, that, that's, the, that's all I wanted to say. It, it's, yeah, yeah. Um, I, 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 the closer we go to what ultimately matters, the less we can actually, uh, you know, learn to learn <laughs> um, directly. Um, and, and so there's sort of a, needs to be an active component. And if I know we need to wrap up, but I mean, as someone that's a bit more, I mean, I love these big ideas, but I wanna say some few things that are a bit more pragmatic as I moved to MGH to actually bring the science to the patients. Um, these 
cell culture models and these animal models don't fully capture the complexity of the biology and the disease. And that's one of the reasons we failed at, at translating some of our findings from cell culture and animal models to patients. And these technologies now allow us to query properly patient samples. And, and beyond trying to develop mechanistic insights of the disease, we have the opportunity to help guide the next generation of clinical trials through drug repurposing because there's a vast library of drugs that have been approved. We just don't know which one to prioritize. And it's fascinating to see in the clinic how they're just using legacy knowledge to best inform how to proceed and are not yet bridging with other communities to really leverage this type of big data sets. And so there's quite an opportunities in the year to come, years to come to start bridging with these other communities to be quite pragmatic, actually. I think that's a great note to end on, um, given that you're actually so much closer to your patients there. Um, thank you, Alexander. Thank you, everyone. Um, I really enjoyed this discussion. I think having having too much, you know, going way over time because everyone's making such great points and having having thoughtful interactions is a good problem to have. So I. I uh, I'm glad that we uh, we gave it the time. Um, I want to thank our, our presenters again, uh, and uh, and say again just how how excited I am to see what what comes out of this this and and future efforts like this. Um, and I'm excited for another year of um, of MIA meetings. Uh, so yeah, thank you all, and and see you soon.